Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to present data from a joint project which has been sponsored by the German Research Foundation. In this project, we try to push high temperature shape memory alloys a bit more towards actual applications. Now, if you think about applications, you need to address the whole process chain from the actual processing all the way to predicting the properties of the component. Today, I will basically address only the microstructure and the property aspects and just give you a glimpse into modeling. Now the progress made would not have been possible without the help from a lot of people and the colleagues shown here are from the universities at Bochum, Munich, Kassel and my group in Hanover. I guess everybody in the audience is aware of the basic ideas of shape memory where we have a structural change from a phase which we call austenite to martensite and it's this crystallographic reversible change that gives us the shape memory effect. Now high temperature shape memory alloys are pretty similar and there's one commonly used definition which says that the martensitic transformation has to occur at a temperature beyond 120 degrees C and you should get something like 3% reversible strain. For an ideal shape memory material there would be a huge market and the estimations from this review paper here state that this is a billion dollar global market. However, so far the actual products are fairly limited. And one can of course solve all the materials issues here if one uses alloys like this one here which has a lot of noble metals. Uh, of course these alloys are very expensive and certainly can only be used in niche applications. So what we looked into were cobalt nickel based materials and titanium tantalum based materials and I will only talk about the later ones here. These alloys uh, should be used for high temperature actuation. They feature a one and two way shape memory effect. And they have pretty good workability because they are titanium based and all the constituents in there are reasonably priced. So all for the uh, applications in mind, the key issue certainly is cyclic stability. So when we looked in those materials, we started with titanium 30 tantalum and then we ran tests which we called thermomechanical fatigue tests. So the temperature is here cycled between room temperature and around 420 degrees C. And when we applied a certain stress, for instance 50 megapascals, then you can see that a small hysteresis opens up. And as we increased the stress, the hysteresis became larger and then we got finally something like 1% strain at temperatures around 200 degrees C. So this looks pretty good. However, the problem already becomes apparent up here. You see that these hysteresis loops do not close fully anymore. We ran some in-situ digital image correlation tests and when we ran the test at 50 megapascals, after unloading, we saw that the strains were almost fully reversible, but at around 150 MPa, you see some islands popping up here. So we decided to limit all our tests to 100 megapascals. So when we then ran the tests with 100 megapascals, the first cycle looks very good. We get something like 1% reversible strain, but you can see that already at the second cycle, there's quite some change and the material has fully degraded at around four cycles. So we have rapid functional degradation in here. So this is the same data again. This was a so-called slow test where the temperature change was pretty slow, 0.33 Kelvin per second. This is the same experiment down here, but this is a fast test with 25 Kelvins per second. And you see that the loops look pretty similar. However, now it takes up to 200 cycles before the material is really degraded. So we have a significant effect of time and especially of the dwell time in the high temperature regime here. So this data indicates that there is a degradation process, process which is controlled by diffusion mechanisms. Then we did X-ray analysis and in the initial material you see all those nice martensite peaks. Then we aged this material here at 350 degrees C and upon cooling then we saw only the beta phase and this tiny little extra peak here which is due to the omega phase and the omega phase is shown up here. It is the formation of this omega phase which causes the stabilization of the austenite and thus degrade the material. 
The omega phase is much better seen in transmission electron microscopy. This here is a TM bright field image. And if we do selected area diffraction, we see these extra spots. And then we can do dark field imaging. And then we see the omega phase, which is this uh, bright round shaped particle here. And the omega phase is around uh, a few nanometers in size. So that's the problem is the formation of the omega phase. Uh, one approach to address this problem is to use ternary alloys. Uh, here you see the electrical resistance at 300 degrees C, normalized by the initial value. And for the binary material here, you see that there's a rapid change in electrical resistance as the omega phase forms. And when we alloy the material with aluminum, you see that this change is delayed. When we ran the first test, we also figured that the defect density is substantially different in the different grains. So we have grains with high defect density and we have grains with low defect density. When we did EBSD on this material, then we saw that the cracks, these are these dark features here where the system could not index anything, uh, have a, ten a tendency to occur along the high angle grain boundaries and also within the 101 oriented grains. One can then calculate the theoretical transformation strain. And this also depends on the grain orientation. So the reason for this crack formation is strain incompatibility. So I think it's quite obvious that one needs to strongly texturize the material to get rid of this effect. So the aluminum does delay the problem, but of course it does not solve it. So we revised the system and this was done by the Bochum group. They used a combinatorial approach with thin film deposition. And what you see here are uh, superimposed X-ray diffraction spectra for a different tantalum content. And one you need for the shape memory effect is the Marden side, which is called the alpha double prime phase here. And you see that there are Marden side peaks at fairly low tantalum contents. So the idea was that tantalum reduction might also give you a shape memory effect. And when we tested those materials, it actually worked. Here's the Martin side star temperature. This was the earlier data, up to 30% tantalum content. And when we decreased the tantalum content, the Martin side star temperature went up. So this gave us potential for really high temperature shape memory alloys. Finally, we decided to use 25% uh, tantalum because we tried to avoid the really high temperatures uh, where we might run into oxidation problems. So this is the first test, a TMF test with low maximum temperature of around 420 degrees C. And the yellow curve here is the initial cycle. And you see you get a nice shape memory behavior with a strain slightly above 2%. So this looks very good. However, you can also see that there is substantial functional degradation, but the functional degradation occurs only here on the low temperature side. So the functional degradation is within the Martin side. And the reason is that we form precipitates, which we can see in this TM image here. But the main uh, reason here is the formation of the omega phase. So when we increased the maximum temperature to what I have called an intermediate temperature here of around 520 degrees C, then the situation starts to change. The material gets softer. So we have dislocation mediated plasticity there. We also form precipitates. But the good news is that we have a partial dissolution of the omega phase which uh, counteracts this effect. So then the idea was to increase the maximum test temperature even further. So we went to 620 degrees C maximum temperature. And now you see that the loops do not change anymore. So there is no functional degradation. However, we had then problems with structural fatigue. Essentially, we got oxidation induced cracks. So in the next step, we went to thermally uh, system, we alloyed it with aluminum, reduced the temperature a bit, and then as you can see here, now we have a stable system with a transformation of around 400 degrees C, and there's hardly any functional degradation anymore. So to sum this up, if we compare the materials with other approaches on the market, so we started here at around 200 degrees C and slightly below 1% strain, we are now at 400 degrees C and around 2% strain. So this is a regime that was only possible with alloys that had noble metals in it. So I think this might really make it to a product. So are there any other uh, developments? 
And what I think is really interesting is what I have called a modeling inspired approach. This was also done by the Bochum group here. They looked into ternary systems and the idea was to find an element that should destabilize the omega phase but not decrease the molten site star temperature. And most alloying elements actually decrease the molten site star temperature, so then this would be no longer a high temperature shape memory alloy. So they looked into various uh, elements and they used what they have called a descriptor derived from first principles. Actually, this is a DFD calculation which is done at 0k and they had to make some assumptions like it's an ideal solid solution and the effects of entropy are negligible. And what they came up with is shown here. Uh, this is a map that shows you the Martin side star temperature color coded. And what you want is a Martin side star temperature from to the left of the red line. The, the red line here is the 120 degree C line. And at the same time, you want to have an uh, element that destabilizes the omega phase and an unstable omega phase is to the right of this blue line. And you see with this element scandium, which turned out to be the best one, here you open up a triangle and up here you should get an attractive combination of high mod side star temperature and no formation of the omega phase. And they attributed this effect to the to a band filling effect. So the scandium destabilizes the beta phase, but it does not stabilize the omega phase because it has a different atomic size than the titanium so the scandium is not favorable in the omega phase either and when they ran the first DSC tests uh, here you see the standard binary material which also shows this rapid functional degradation in the DSC curves the new alloy does not show this anymore so you can see uh, 15 cycles without hardly any change in the shape so this modeling inspired approach seems to work. So anything else? Uh, there are additional new avenues and what I think is really interesting are high entropy alloys. These alloys are special in terms of their strengths. These materials also have slow diffusion, show good structural stability. People have seen twinning in there, precipitates, and there have also been reports about the mountain's leak transformation. And the first one is this one from first of here. And in this data, here you see when you apply a load and you cool down the material, you get a strain change. When you unload and heat up, then the strain is fully recovered. So this was the first report here in three-point bending. And the initial approach uh, had started with a what's called a quasi-stichiometric uh, system. Uh, this is, of course, related to the NITI. And the Oster is also a P21 with nickel and titanium occupying the sublattices and these additional elements replacing nickel and titanium respectively. And the high strength is good because this curtails the dislocation mediated plasticity. Now recently we have uh, modified this approach. Again, we substitute nickel and titanium by other elements, but we looked into very large deviations from this uh, ideal near equiatomic composition. You see here the nickel equivalent is 50 and we went down to a nickel equivalent of 35, so we have 15 atomic percent of this composition. And when we did this and measured the modern side star temperature, which is shown here, you can see the binary system, this is the open symbols here, can only work on the nickel rich side. You cannot go to the titanium rich side, but with these new alloys, we can actually have a fairly large deviation from this uh, ideal composition, and this brings up the modern side star temperature, and again, we have high temperature shape memory behavior. So it's this additional degree of freedom that we can use to control the transformation temperatures. Of course, we have to uh, evaluate the mechanical properties, but these are tests currently underway. Now to sum this up, I think these are really fascinating, but of course complex materials. We have very attractive properties already. We have transformation temperatures well above 120 degrees C. The strains are close to 3% at the moment. These materials are reasonably priced, show good cyclic stability. And I think we can push this further with these new approaches. Advanced modeling is certainly the way to go and high entropy alloys might push this even further. There is one big challenge, the challenge is to transfer all this knowledge to real world applications. And I think one roadblock is the need for simple models. This already brings me to the end of my talk and I'm looking forward 
to your questions. Thank you.